I thought I'd have to talk for quite a while, but knowing him, I won't have to now. <laughs> now, I, I feel quite honored to introduce this speaker tonight. And if you have any question, why the red jacket? He and I belong to the same group, and you'll hear about that. Now, our speaker is Ernest Shaw. came to Milwaukee, and while he was in Milwaukee as a youngster, he attended four schools, not all at the same time. <laughs> Principals didn't kick him out. But anyhow, Ernie Shaw attended, first of all, a school that I would have known as being on fifth and Madison Street. In case you don't know Madison, it's a block north of Greenfield Avenue, and it was on 10th. And I didn't know him, of course. At that time, he lived only about four blocks from my home. I lived on Old, as it was known then, first in Washington, and he lived on 3rd and Mineral, which was a block north of Washington. So you see, we were practically neighbors way back there. But then in 1893, uh, uh, they moved to Bayview here. And in Bayview, they lived, I believe it was called at that time, South Bay. And now it's East Bay. And the area in which his home was located is now practically only a factory area, but from what Ernie told us tonight, it is not part of the factory area, as I understood it at present. It's owned by some other organization. But it's right on Winchester, right close to Winchester and East Bay, where he lived. And this is interesting. It's the only house at this time north of East Bay and west, I think, or east of Mound Street, as I remember it. Now, uh, he and I met at Southside Old Timers. In case there are any of you who don't know who the Southside Old Timers are, I see a couple sitting here. Mm -hmm. It's a group that attended South Division High School. And there's another one over here, a teacher, that comes to our meetings quite regularly. Last week, we had a meeting and there were 116, you would call them, attendants at South Division. And I want to tell you this, that as far as I know, and I check records quite a bit, Ernie Shaw, I think, has missed only one meeting since his first, and I think he was traveling at that time. Now, I'm not sure of that, Ernie, and I might have mixed you up with someone else, but I'm pretty sure that's about it. So... Uh, He's been quite an attendant. And then uh, it happened that in November at one of the meetings, someone questioned Ernie's good judgment as to why he would come that night or that noon hour when the weather was so bad. And here was his answer. You know, this is quite an organization coming to the meeting is the best tonic in the world for me. And you know when he said it? When he was 99 years of age, and the weather that November was not something that you'd like to be out in. Now, how can a fellow at his age level have a record like that, that he has practically attended all these meetings and never missed, summer or winter? Now, I try to keep myself both physically and mentally fit by avoiding excuses for anything I do. Is that a good uh, point to make for all of us? I try to avoid heated arguments. 
a couple of fellows in here and one or two ladies that I hope heard that. Uh, I try to avoid the heated argument. I mean, those are the ones I know. I try to avoid heated arguments which may interfere with your friendship and health. Uh, here's his third point. I have always done my own thinking. When I find I am wrong, I immediately change my thoughts and change my thinking. That's quite an idea. And this is the advice he got, and this might explain why Ernie is the kind of fellow he is. This is what his father said, that he would meet a lot of rough spots in his life but it was not a sin to be uh, knocked down, but it was a disgrace not to get up again. That's what his father told him. <laughs> and he says this, and naturally I think the same, with that advice from his father, that is why he is still on his feet at 103 years of age. Now, Ernie, I've been accused always of talking too long, but I'm stopping now, and will you come up and be with me, please, now? You want to sit down at the mic here? Paul, I flipped something here. You better okay. check it. That's okay. I heard something flip. He told me he's a little stiff. He fell down the other day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you want to hold this or... Oops, I think. You better go forward there. Okay. Shut I fell down. Are you the mic? I was scooping over in the bedroom. A tired shoe will do something. I don't know what it was. But I fell backwards and landed on my shoulder in the back of my neck. <laughs> that kind of stiffened me up all around. Of course, when you get up to the age that I am, you can't take this punishment just as readily as you could when you were 25, you know. But uh, I get through with it all right. As long as I can get up and get around, eat my meals every day, and mingle with my people, that's all we can ask. Well, uh, this fellow here, he gave me quite a story here about my life and age. Well, it's, it's true. This, the statements that he made were, I think, as close as I could get them, would be about right. That's the kind of a life I tried to lead. And uh, it's played off. I've had hard spots. But I've always enjoyed them. In other words, with all my troubles ups and downs in the world, I've enjoyed it. It's always a way out, you know, and it works all right. But we're talking about being out here at uh, Bayshore. Well, I was born in 18, 1880, and in 1888, uh, and, that 18, and then I was brought here to Milwaukee as an infant. In 1888, well, I, my dad came to Milwaukee here and he bought a house out on the old E. P. Ellis estate which was located between Mound and Alice Street on South Bay then and North to Stewart or over back of the marsh in the tanneries. And he built the house that he stated was still there. Well, in those days, the carpenters built houses a little differently. <laughs> they had plenty of good lumber and there's a cheap. And any lumber they were using that didn't look too good to them, they just saw it out and threw it in scrap, which don't happen today. But maybe that's one reason why the old shanty stays there. I don't know. Well, as I remember it, when we got up on Mount Street, up on uh, South Bay Street there, 
I went to that school, as he said, at a Mount Street school. They only talked at the fifth grade then. And then we were transferred back to the old school to finish our program in the old 12th Ward School, it was known at that time. We graduated there. Then from there I went to the uh, South Division High School. I stayed with them for a couple of years and I pulled out and joined a special private engineering society because at that time I knew I wouldn't get the experience I wanted, needed in the school. So this special engineering society, we met once a week. I guess I was with them for about two or three years with a personal t teaching of a, of a fellow who was a professional engineer. And uh, you, can get, you can get down where you want to go pretty quick that way. Well, from there, I uh, had several different places to go to. I was in business a little while for myself, engineering. I worked for the uh, Hold Off Machinery Company for a while. Then I went back to the Alice Summers Company, and I stayed with them until 1950. Became engine chief engineer of the, the division of sawmills, flour mills, and special transmission machinery. And I was, wife wasn't feeling good at that time, and I resigned and gave up the thing. But I, I've had enough of it by that time. And I used to travel all over the United States on trouble jobs and new work, and I worked on all new engineering, special work. I didn't care to patch things up. And of course, you naturally, if you're earnest in, the, in, your, in your work, you acquire a very acute analytical mind. You don't take anything for granted. You've got to go to the base of the thing, find out what's what, and start there. Well, that's where my life went. But getting back to this uh, South Bay Street again, I, we lived there for seven, I lived there with them, the whole folks for 17 years, I think it was. And uh, then I was married. And, 1905, and I lived up on Mount Street, farther up toward Lincoln. And from there I went across over to the west side. But, you know, the, the streets there in the, at that time, in the early 90s, they were all just clay streets with gravel. And all of the big trucks were working in a uh, horse and buggy days, and we had no automobiles, very few motors of any kind. And uh, the streets were just uh, crowned with gravel and dirt, and rolled in an oval for the, for the, for the crown, and guttered on the sides, built up with field stone. And they run on down to the sewer and drain. Then on the corner, every so often, we had big tanks, maybe about 10 or 12 inches wide and four feet long, filled with water from the faucets to let the horses drink as they come along. It's all taken care of that way. And I think there was only one road that I remember seeing paved by, that was old Kinnikinnick, was paved there with red cedar blocks little round blocks that put a planking on the, on the ground, then the blocks put them in tight and then filled them up with torn gravel. Well, they were all right as long as it lasted, but they didn't last too long. Well, let me see. From, uh, from there, I, had, I worked at the Alice Company then I, when I went back to them to, uh, in 
1917, I guess it was. And uh, I had an, uh, an appointment to go over to Muskegon, Michigan, and to take take over the the uh, clearing up of the foundry over there, putting it in shape as master mechanic. Well, I quit the job at the house and I took a good money out of it. And I revised and remodeled the whole shop, put it on a good basis. And then the second year, they made me master uh, the uh, superintendent of the whole plant. So that put another load on my neck. And I stayed there until 1920. Then I gave it all up and came back and went to the engineering business again. But I enjoyed all of the work, it's creative work, you know. And I, was, I have no text about it at all. My father was a fellow that when he got his teeth into a job, well, he never let go. And we all trained along the same line. <laughs> so I, I had a good early training with the dad and parents, very proud of them. I think, I think my father was one of the finest fellows I ever knew. He, he would work with me and show me things, do things, and what you do with your hands, you don't forget. You can read about them, they tell you how to do them. But if you actually got to take your coat off and, and do it, you don't forget it. And uh, he said, there's always, always a way out. Just stay with it. And sometimes you feel like throwing your job in the icebox. But the fellow said, you've got to hang on to it and keep it going, and eventually you'll get out of it. Well, that's been my life, and I've really enjoyed it. And you now I've been retired since 1950. Uh, had a special engineering business of my own for about 12 years since then, but that got too tiresome too for me, so I ditched that. So I'm living there with my daughter now, cutting grass, not cutting grass, but did a lot of jobs I can do around the house to keep out of trouble. So that's been about my life, fellas, and I really enjoyed these meetings where you meet people like you here, your older people, you have seen the things, you've had the experience, you talk about things and you know what you're talking about, and it's really educating. And uh, it's really interesting. And we get down to the old Southside Old Timers Club down there. I meet so many fellows down there. They've gone through the mill, they've had experience, and you get to know them, and it's uh, really nice. Well, folks, I won't take any more your time here. I could go on for an hour and a half, but, <laughs> but I won't take up that much time. But I, I'm awfully glad that I had an opportunity to be here at this meeting and to meet most of you, so you'll know who I am and I'll know who you are the next time we meet. And I hope that will be soon. So with God's blessing, I'll say goodbye. Would you like to answer some questions? Would you like to sit down and answer a few questions? If I can. If I can. Uh, would there be any questions you'd like to ask? John? Mr. Shaw, when you were growing up on Mound Street, you were working over on Jones Island. And what do you recall of visiting there? When you go over on Jones Island, when you go around Jones Island at that time, there's all the fishermen down there. Of course, the, uh, the, the, there are fishermen's huts down there. And uh, the, it was uh, one of the prettiest places you want to see if you want to paint a pretty picture. Uh, it's artistic with the, with the water and the waves coming in. And the old home, cabins and stuff. And that's, there was a, an artist that worked for the Alice Company. And he had a, a, a desk right back of me, and he went down there on Sunday morning, and he painted a watercolor picture of, uh, down on the island down there. And he came back and told me he had 
painted this picture, eh? looked at it. So what do you think about it? It's a pretty picture. Trees and everything else, bushes. So he left. I didn't hear any more about him until about two years ago. He went to New York, a business down there, and the mention was made of a picture that he painted in Milwaukee on the island that was he wouldn't sell to anybody. That was its price. So that was a pretty place down there. <coughs> I enjoyed this. You used to have some breakwaters out there on Jones Island to smash up the breaking water in them and the waves because it, uh, it, when you have rough weather like this, six foot waves and stuff like that, that lake now is all filled in along there. But that is very narrow, just for a radio track and so forth. But the waves were strong enough to hit the breakwaters and drive it over the mass and the ships of the old iron ore ships that run just on the other side of the river. You see, there was a uh, a slip from Rosin Jones Island that runs south about uh, maybe a block and uh, that was an outcome that was left over from the old harbor and there was a big ice house down there and that's what they used to store the ice for the uh, people and general communities. They'd uh, let the ice freeze up and that strip of water in there until this is about a foot thick. Then they'll take their markers and mark it out and say two or four foot, three foot squares, two and a foot thick. And they would uh, take hand, big hand saws and cut it and float it up to the conveyor and stack it in that big ice house. And that was the only cooling system we had there. The, the automatic refrigerators were unknown except in a big way, but not for the ordinary users. They brought the ice man, came along with these old ice wagon every morning, and he'd get these tongs and get a chunk of ice out there and carry it in, throw it in the ice chest. Well, that's the way it went. So, there were so many things that were different nowadays. Well, that's about all I know about Joe's Island. It is a pretty place to live. Here we have one. Could you tell us about Puddler's Hall, what you would call? Puddler's Hall. Do you remember anything about Puddler's Hall? I don't remember. No, I think that was after his time. <laughs> Puddler's Hall? Puddler's Hall, where the puddlers from the uh, rolling mills used to go. The cross and the three brothers, near the railroad track. I've forgotten it, perhaps. It's been a long time no. ago. Yeah. Another question? Anything else? Uh, what nationality were the people on Jones Island? Well, they were mixed. They were mostly all Norwegians down there, and they got into the fishing business, you know. Swedish, Norwegian. They, and, and they didn't own the land, did they? They were squatters. No, they bought the land up after a while. They did? Yeah. Well, you see, originally, they, the main harbor there was hand handmade. Not in my time, but uh, it was uh, the, the harbor leading into our three rivers that came in was down here up south, about uh, a block and a half. And, but they had trouble getting these big sailboats coming in there with their loads, and they couldn't get in there. And they decided that they would uh, dig that harbor straight out. And in those days, they had no mechanical plows or anything like that. So they got the gang together and they cut a trench right straight through where the harbor is now, wide enough to get so the vessels would float in. But the thing would fill up on them and it was sand and dirt. So they finally got an, a, 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 a grant from the U.S. government for $15,000 to replant that side of that thing so they could make a harbor that was usable. Then the, the other thing, of course, <coughs> when they cut that out, there was known as, a, as an island there. There was water on both ends of them. <laughs> water was a nice place down there. They yeah. lived by themselves, didn't bother anybody, went out to their fishing boats. So, 
Okay, we have a question here. Do you remember uh, the old pier at the harbor entrance when they had the old lighthouse quarter that some kind of an old wooden yeah, house uh, that was there? I, I, I was up in that house many times. A friend of mine was a lighthouse keeper there. Foggy, My dad Foggy was a Kinison? lighthouse keeper there. Huh? Was it Foggy Kinison? I don't know. That was my grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> my dad was a lighthouse keeper there, but when we lived there, the brick house was built there. Yeah. But long before that, there was some kind of old wooden house. There's a wooden house out there. Yeah. And uh, I remember he was, he was a, a fellow that was there. I, I knew him, but he was a personal friend of my dad's. So we used to go down there once in a while and go out on the end of that rocky old brick water, the end of the pier, and get up in the tower. So it was an old, old-fashioned thing, but it worked. Well, do you still have any brothers or sisters? They're all gone. I've had, I had two brothers and two sisters. Mm -hmm. and all the, I'm the only one left. Did they live to a, an old? Did they live to an old age? No, they went to a normal age. Some of them in the 50s, 60s, 80s, 70s. Long in there. No, I don't know what I'm here for anyhow. Huh? He said you must be doing something right. <laughs> I don't know. We have a question back there. Did you go to Mount Street School? How old is Mount Street School? How old is the school? I don't know what they I never looked at the the block on there, but at the school was there when I was out there in eighty eight, I know. Four years old when you went there. It was an old school. I know when they chased the kids into the dressing rooms that time, they were being cockeyed or noisy around that way. There's a big rain pipe outside of the building, and they'd get on that rain pipe and shinny down and go home. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Would you want to tell us what your salary was at Ellis? My salary in those days, well, when I, well, the salary varied as you went along, you know. But when you, when I, let me see, it takes somewhere to certain age. I had about 10 years' experience about that time. Oh, hell, we didn't get much money. <laughs> we got, uh, if you got uh, $56 a month. That was good money. Mm How -hmm. much was a suit of clothes then? About $3? Huh? A suit of clothes at that time when you got $50 some dollars a month. Buy them for almost nothing. <laughs> you to bring them down there in these big boats and they pull them into the harbor and unloaded them down at the old Kinnickinick Bridge. That old bridge is a hand turned bridge. You ever see one of them? Mm -hmm. So you put the bar down the center, and man gets each side and goes around. Well, the old bridge was one of those. <coughs> yeah. The question is asked about Mount Street. The one he attended was the original and was the primary school, and the Mount we know was a different school, and it was located further south, and its main entrance was over on Mount Street. Well, this was on Winchester and East Bay, hmm. the primary. Now, that's my memory. The primary.